Hello, welcome back to another I Care for Your Brain with board certified neuropsychologist, Dr. Karen Sullivan. I am here to give you evidence-based brain health education so you can be your very best advocate. Tonight, we are talking about the future of brain health and I'm going to give you my five predictions. What a time to be alive. We are making leaps and bounds in our knowledge about the brain from a neurophysiological level, but also what I really, really love a little bit more is we're really developing person-centered approaches in brain health. We now understand that brain health is whole person health. And what I mean by this is we need the scientific advancements, but we also need to ground brain health in our humanity and in our psychology. We have to demedicalize neurological conditions and experiences to truly serve the needs of people who live with brain health challenges. So my first prediction about brain health in the future is that we are going to prioritize brain health much, much earlier. What we do know about risks for cognitive impairment like dementia is that it really comes down to a balance between managing our risk factors and enhancing what we call our cognitive reserve. And now that we've identified the different behaviors in each of those categories, what we now know is that we actually need to start caring about them much earlier than when we turn the age of 65 or when we start to have gray hair, right? We actually need to prioritize these things even earlier than you might think, really going back to even in utero. So we know that there are modifiable risk factors that start in the womb, that continue at every stage of development, that increase our chances of future neurodegeneration. So I really think what we're gonna start to see is that we talk about brain health as much more of a lifespan issue. We're going to take a much longer view on brain health and not have it just be something that we associate with end of life and not wanting to lose our memories. Prediction number two is I think that most of us are going to soon be offered genetic testing to better understand our risk genes as it comes to dementia, which are either genetic mutations or genetic variants. This is especially going to be the case for those of us who have a family history history in either a parent, a grandparent, a sibling, or an aunt or uncle. One in four of us over the age of 55 have one of those close relatives that have been diagnosed with dementia. And our genes do play a role to varying degrees in our susceptibility to getting dementia, either caused by single gene mutations or multi-gene variant. So one way to kind of know where your family could be at is the age of onset of a cognitive disorder. So someone who is younger, in their 40s, their 50s, this is much more likely to be genetic than someone who starts to have a decrease in memory in their 80s or 90s. That is much more likely to be due to a combination of some genetic variability, susceptibility meets with those risk factors, protective factors that I talked about before. So we have young onset dementia, which is before the age of 65. And the subtypes that come to mind are frontotemporal dementia, which would be like primary progressive aphasia, Asia, behavioral, behavioral variant, frontotemporal dementia, and these are often caused by changes in single genes. So what we think of the most uh, likely cause of dementia in most of us is a complex lock and key interaction between these genetic risk factors and, like I said, the, the lifestyle risk factors. So what we are able to do better and better is to identify not only those mutations, but also the variants that might make us more susceptible. So when it comes to Alzheimer's, we're pretty clear that there is a gene called the APOE that comes in three different versions. We get each one from, uh, each one has a different effect on our risk level. So you can have uh, APOE2, APOE3 and APOE4, and you can either have one or two of each. Having two APOEs is, having two APOE twos is slightly protective and having two APOE4 can increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease by 10 times. It doesn't necessarily mean someone is going to get it, but it just means that you would be on the radar of specialists earlier. You might be offered earlier intervention and you yourself might have increased motivation for wanting to reduce those risk factors. Now, this is a very interesting new subspecialty field within brain health called, and a subtype within medical ethics called neuroethics. So the question is, would you actually want to know in your 20s or your 30s if you were 
genetically predetermined to have a very high risk of dementia? Is that something that you psychologically would be motivated by or could it really dampen your quality of life? So we know before genetic testing, people must undergo counseling and we're having people who are coming up in the field really be trained in neuro degenerative illnesses because it's got its own special flavor that we need to be talking to people about. My number three prediction is that monoclonal antibody infusions will be the gold standard to treat dementia in the next few decades. So we also call these MABs. They've been around since the 1980s and they've really offered us precision immune mediated care in cancer, autoimmune and dementias are the newest to the market. So in 2023, we had our very first ever disease modifying medication medication for Alzheimer's disease in the form of Aduhelm, which has now gone away, but we have Lequembi that's still here, Lequembi, Lequembi, Lequembi. People say it a little different. Um, both are um, from a, a co-junct collaboration from a Japanese company called Asai and then Boston's Biogen. We know that these MABs are mostly given in infusions, but we do see subcutaneous versions that have also been validated. So they owe their success to advances in immunology, molecular biology, and biochemistry. These are precision compounds that have been tested for many, many years on rat models that contain compounds that are able to cross the blood brain barrier and attach to the aggregated form of amyloid, the unfortunate proteins that we think are largely responsible for the development of Alzheimer's disease, break it down and then sweep it out. There is a very impressive structural reduction in amyloid that happens, but what we're not so tickled with quite yet is the improvement in function. And mostly that's because experts think we're actually starting much too late when the amyloid has already suffocated brain cells for decades before the clinical symptoms of memory loss or word finding difficulties or apathy appear. So in the future, many of us are going to know exactly what our APOE status is and we will be offered a MAB much earlier than we are now. Number four prediction is that brain health will be distributed throughout the healthcare system. It will no longer be simply in the hands of experts like a neurologist or a neuropsychologist even, because we have a very significant supply and demand issue. We have many uh, folks in our world who are coming to the what we call at-risk age for dementia. So for every five years you age over 65, your risk for the dementias doubles exponentially. Doesn't mean that it's inevitable. Plenty of 100-year-old people are still sharp as a tack, but age is is the most non-modifiable risk factor after genetic mutations that we have for dementia. And the truth is we just don't have enough specialists to assess and manage all of the people who are going to have the different subtypes of dementia over the next year. So right now the average wait time to see a neurologist in the US is 10 months. And if nothing changes by 2026, they're predicting that this wait will be four years years. Imagine if you had to wait four years to see a neurologist. Neuropsychologists and neurologists would have to increase by 238% to meet the need in the next four to five years of just Americans who need brain health specialty care. So we are going to have to retrain the entire medical system from primary care to emergency room responders to palliative and hospice teams to both identify and diagnose many cases of dementia. Surely the most complex ones will still need to go to a specialist, um, but there are many people who do have medication effects that could be managed in primary care if we were able to get them some really good quality continuing ed so everybody would understand the impact of certain medications. There are many treatable things that can either look like dementia or exacerbate a baseline dementia that will be relegated back into primary care. That is my position. Uh, number five, my final prediction is that, thank goodness, personalized whole brain health person care will be the norm. And we have known forever that no two brains are alike and each person really thrives when we customize their brain health treatment plan to them because what is going to be good for you isn't necessarily what's going to be good for me. 
Whole person health is exactly that. You're looking at the whole person, not just separate organ systems. So we wanna really get away from this medical idea that brain health has everything to do with the brain because it also is related to health and well being in physical, social, emotional, and spiritual realms. It all, all matters. So when we say we take a whole person approach to brain health, what we mean is that the person's assessment, their care, the recommendations that we have are going to be extremely customized to them. It is not a one size fits all type of phenomenon. And when we do that, people get better and they get better care. And I think that's why so many of you who have seen a neuropsychologist since you've started following me, been six years now, know that that is a very satisfying appointment. You hopefully are feeling like you are an expert alongside of your neuropsychologist and that you really are a part of a team that is working together to figure everything out to the best of our ability. So these are my five predictions and I wanna know what you think. You guys are experts too, so I'd love to know what do you see as the future of brain health care? I would really appreciate Appreciate if you would leave me a comment below. Please like this video. Please subscribe to us here. Uh, as often as we can, we try to get here and let you know uh, what is going on in the world of science-based brain health so you don't get exploited by too good to be true scams and that you can go into your doctor's appointments empowered with the highest quality information possible. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next time. Bye. Mm -hmm.